So that leaves us where, as far as Robert Burton is concerned and what we're doing. Um, I think one of the, the really important insights I got, and sometimes I, I will have to preface this by saying, uh, frequently you're going to get a really good insight. Good insights often come from cross-referencing. So if you just read one book from one point of view and that's sort of it, um, typically well, some things happen, but if you say read three or four different works coming from different angles that are kind of touching on the same subject, you can um, often experience something like an exponential expansion of um, your mental space. And exponential expansion of mental space is probably a pretty cool thing to have going on, especially if you're young when the mind is very neuroplastic. At my age, trying to expand my mind is kind of like I don't know what it's like. It's like working as a bricklayer of thought. <laughs> Just, you know, constantly having to do demolition on pre-existing structures that were built out of untested materials, take them down, replace them with new stuff. Uh, it's a real pain in the butt in, in middle age when, you know, it, it could have been taken care of. But hey, you know, when I was a kid, like in the 60s, we didn't know a lot of this stuff. Um, so anyway, back to Burton and where he's at and all that junk. Um, Burton has made this, this very important insight and that I'm probably repeating, but it's worth repeating. Some insights are worth repeating. Some things are worth tediously hammering on about because they are so, they are such critical distinctions in how our lives are going to work and the kind of leaps we're going to make. And um, I think one of the, the first things we have to, to really get down is that dogmatism and rigidity and a sense of uh, sort of inassailable correctness is not only found in Ayatollahs, um, although Ayatollahs seem to gravitate to that style of thinking. Nothing other than that personally against Ayatollahs, other than that mentality seems to, to get a little uh, self-limiting. Um, but very, very respected scientists. Um, uh, people that we consider uh, significant people of thought um, also get very dogmatic and they get very locked in. Um, and just as much as some dude living in a you know, coal mining town in a trailer in West Virginia, it's really strange that you can see the same kind of rigidifying and dogmatizing processes across whole spectrums of people, from people in, in the most limited circumstances to the most exalted circumstances. Yet, as I think Burton very ably points out, these, these kind of uh, grippings onto one reveals truth belief, this, this kind of belief that by God I have found the Philosopher's Stone and here it is on my finger, all 22 carats of it, is, is, a, is, a, is a foible that's just built into us. when. Probably part of a survival mechanism is, is tasty little primates that were like two inches ahead of a hungry lion's jaws and that uh, little primate had to be real damn sure that the best thing to do is to get up a tree real quick without thinking too hard about it. Um, so this, this, this sort of absolute, this, I guess you would call it a reflex to absolutisms or a, a reflex to um, so, uh, fixed truths is interestingly an, an evolved reflex in us from our very very early days as um, little delicious critters that were out there in the savannah with uh, sharing space with big hungry critters and so this probably is built into our DNA so as nulpers one of our I think breakthrough uh, areas of development is how do we deal with these different forms of um, framing hard framing hard case hard ass um, you know, bloody-minded, I think they like to say, um, stone-headed, knuckle-headed, rigid ways of getting stuck in certain boxes. So we'll pick up on that and move that conversation forward later.